today, which doesn't surprise me at all. This is really an extraordinary day for the Department of Surgery here at UC Davis. A day to celebrate our distinguished past, to really uh, help what is a relatively young department uh, develop a sense of tradition and honor some of the greats who have gone before us. It's a very special opportunity to do that when we have one of those greats still among us. And I'm so thrilled to have the friends and family of Dr. Fry with us today. So just to give you a little background, uh, Dr. Fry is a legend in the world of the pancreas. And to honor him today, we are having one of the contemporary legends in the world of pancreas disease, Dr. Keith Lillimo, the chairman of the Department of Surgery at uh, Mass General. So it's just the perfect assemblages of greatness uh, here in Sacramento to really uh, celebrate a very special day. Uh, Charlie, as he's known to most of his friends and family, and it's really a thrill to see so many of you here, both his daughters, one of your sons, um, family and friends, colleagues from all around the country, uh, as far away as Yale, and your pilot son, I think, is the one that, that is, wasn't able to get off his flying schedule, although he may be flying some of you home, so <laughs> I mean, you'll have to ask. <laughs> um, but in any event, uh, Dr. Fry was born in New York, attend, graduated from Amherst, went to Cornell for medical school, and then really started his illustrious uh, surgical career in Michigan, at the University of Michigan, before he came to us here, where he is a longtime member of the Department of Surgery, executive vice chair of the department, and known for most for having really developed the Pancreas Club. The other piece is, particularly for you young people, he has an operation named after him that is still uh, done and performed today, and there aren't very many of us who end up with an operation in our name. So it really uh, is an extraordinary opportunity. Dr. Fry, if you would like to make a few comments, we'd love to just hear from you for a minute. And I think he hinted to me that he had one or two thoughts about this. <laughs> What I especially love about Dr. Fry today is this very snazzy outfit. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks a lot. I'm overwhelmed, Dr. Farmer. <laughs> that was very, very nice of you. Um, I'm very honored today to have the opportunity to talk to this elite group of house staff, nurses, and faculty, and uh, honored guests. The purpose of this lectureship was to stimulate the interest of fellows, residents, medical students and nurses in the study of pancreatic disease, which has long been neglected in terms of research funding and clinical resources. I and others, including one of our guests, Bill Nealon, who is here, um, and our speaker, Keith Lillimo, and his mentor, John Cameron at Johns Hopkins, and his predecessor as chairman of surgery at Massachusetts General Hospital, uh, Andrew Warshaw, uh, and faculty member Richard Bowl, took the road less traveled to meet an unmet need, as did Diana Farmer in a different area of surgery. I think uh, many of you may come to a decision point who are faculty members, 
fellows, residents, and medical students. When you have a decision point, uh, when you can follow the road well trod by others or become a pioneer as the Diana Farmer in a new area of surgery. The poet Robert Frost, I think, said it best. I came to a fork in the road and I took the road less travel. I hope some of you will consider doing so in the future. I want to pay a special tribute to Diana Farmer for making this lectureship possible through her vision, energy, and generosity. I also want to thank my wife Jane, who is here today. Uh, she was a very talented woman, or she is a very talented woman, <laughs> <laughs> and she uh, uh, was a licensed marriage and family counselor, very successful practice in the state of California, and uh, has been a hospice worker for the last 15 years. And she is still as radiant and beautiful as the day we were married 56 years ago. <laughs> I also want to thank um, Catherine Keyes for her help and uh, particularly for uh, Ricky Stevens for arranging uh, this splendid event. <coughs> And uh, I think uh, I am the oldest person in this room. <laughs> and uh, as a result, I'm entitled to say, I hope all you kids have some, learn something today and have some fun. <laughs> Thank you very much. There's a lesson in there that it's probably a really smart thing to marry a marriage and family therapist if you want to have a <laughs> happy marriage. <laughs> Note to self. <laughs> so with that, I want to really uh, take the opportunity to introduce our distinguished guest and thank again some of our uh, special visitors who I saw snuck, sneak into the room uh, on the side who normally are not here on a Tuesday, so Dr. Freshlight, thank you very much for coming. The uh, honor I have today is of introducing Dr. Keith Lillimo. I met Dr. Lillimo uh, in, in a more unofficial capacity when the two of us were part of a group that was reviewing the, doing the stewardship review for the Department of Surgery at Washington University in St. Louis. And right away I thought, I was a little intimidated, the chairman of Mass General, the chair at Penn, and I'm the chair at Sacramento. You know, how did we put this together? And I realized these were really nice guys um, who had a lot to bring to medicine. And we, we uh, hit up a friendship, and I realized later then he was from South Dakota. He's a good Midwestern folk at heart. <laughs> so... Um, all of that uh, fanciness that we all know comes really not from where you are, but from the contributions that you make. And Dr. Lillimo, through his distinguished career, uh, largely at Johns Hopkins and then later at uh, the University of Indiana and then now ultimately at Mass General where he is the uh, Jerry Austin Professor, the Chairman of the Department, the Surgeon in Chief of the Hospital of Mass General. Uh, has made enormous contributions to the field of uh, pancreas care and pancreatic cancer in specific. He's been president of almost all of the major organizations. He is the editor of one of our most distinguished journals and currently is the president of the American Surgical Association, arguably the most a prominent surgical organization in this country. It is really a great honor and pleasure to have Dr. Lillimo as our inaugural 
a professor and inaugural lecturer for the Charlie Fry Lectureship. Thank you. <laughs> So uh, we're set here. Uh, I really very much would like to uh, uh, compliment Diana, Julie, uh, the faculty, the friends, to having the, uh, the vision to, uh, do I need this? Okay. To have the vision to uh, put together this lecture to, uh, to honor uh, Dr. Fry. Uh, every institution, whether it be an old institution like uh, the MGH, uh, intermediate institution like Hopkins or uh, a young institution like really any of the, uh, <laughs> the uh, California schools uh, is built on the shoulders of giants and recognizing the history of an institution by recognizing those giants is very very important and I can say both at this institution but really in the entire field of pancreatic surgery that there is no bigger giant than Charlie Fry and again, my compliments and, and appreciation for you as an institution for recognizing Charlie and my great appreciation. I'm so honored to be asked to give the, uh, the first uh, uh, Charlie Fry lecture. Uh, all right. So uh, have you seen the pictures of Charlie? Uh, uh, you look just as good as you did when you were married many years ago as well, <laughs> but uh, particularly in the neat fleece, I like that. Uh, but the, uh, uh, really, Charlie is, is, uh, uh, had a great impact on, on the field of, of uh, pancreatic disease. Uh, as Julie, or as uh, Diana mentioned, uh, for me to come to, uh, to UC Davis and to talk about uh, chronic pancreatitis, is, is like bringing coals to Newcastle. Oh, turn it on, that'll work. Huh? Uh, bringing coals to Newcastle, because uh, clearly this is an area where Charlie has had great impact and has, has uh, really contributed far more than really almost anybody in the field. So uh, again, as was mentioned, uh, Charlie's contributions were not only in studying the disease, but, but actually coming up with new and innovative ways to treat the, the disease. And uh, again, to have a procedure named after you is, is pretty impressive. It's a brilliant procedure, to be honest. It, it combined the combination of, of ductal drainage, uh, which was part of the old Pusteau procedure, which works pretty darn good, with also some excision of the head of the gland, which Charlie and many people have for many years considered the, the pacemaker of the disease. And by combining those two in a relatively straightforward, simple operation, as opposed to some of the complex ones that were coming out of Germany at the time, uh, I think was, was brilliant. Uh, Charlie's initial presentation of, of this uh, new technique was at the American Surgical Association meeting where uh, uh, he brought forth this and he continued to study the disease and study the treatment with prospective randomized trials and really contributed greatly in this area. Now, as Diana said, I came from Hopkins. We did a little bit of pancreatic surgery there, but we didn't do as much chronic pancreatitis as we did neoplasms. That's because it's too darn hard. Pancreatic, <coughs> chronic pancreatitis is one of the most difficult diseases to treat. First of all, you have to decide who needs an operation or who will benefit from it. Secondly, you, you have to decide which is the best operation to do, and in my opinion, the Fry operation is the best operation to do. And then finally, even if you do everything perfectly, there's no guarantee that you're going to make those patients any better, and they are a challenging group to take care of. But, but clearly, uh, this operation is a great tool to have in your toolbox as you treat those patients. And uh, Charlie, uh, if it wasn't just for this, you would have made major contributions to the field of pancreatic surgery. But I think most of us who, who love the pancreas love it because of Charlie's other major contribution, <clears throat> and probably something that was most close to his heart, which is the establishment of the Pancreas Club with, with his good friend, Bill Schiller. And, and uh, I have to say, it was, uh, when it was formed, uh, I was just starting a, a medical school. I attended my first meeting in 1981, uh, and I don't think I've missed many since, since that first meeting. Uh, it was a meeting, uh, uh, again, the initial one was held in, in that's not right, is it? It's, it wasn't in 1996, it was, 19, it was earlier than that. That's an error on my part. But there were 10 attendees, 
Uh, and in 2015, there were 313 attendees. These aren't just surgeons. They're pathologists. They're gastroenterologists. They are, are uh, uh, basic scientists. It is a tremendous group. But because of, of the leadership that Charlie brought into it, it's avoided all the politics of all the other organizations, and it stayed a club. And it is a tremendous success. And there are people who come from all over the world to DDW, Digestive Disease Week, not because of the SSAT or the surgical group or AGA. They come just for the Pancreas Club. That wouldn't be the case without, without Charlie's leadership. Uh, it brought together some of the, the, the mammoths, the disease of, of, of uh, uh, pancreatic, in the treatment of pancreatic surgery. Uh, uh, this is John Howard, and although the name Whipple is on the operation, I think it was Howard who brought this operation really into the, to the mainstream and of the contemporary. Uh, I see we have uh, one of our military residents here. Uh, John Howard was Trapper John from the, the, the TV show uh, and movie MASH. Uh, and, and we lost John not too many years ago. He was a tremendous uh, leader and, and really uh, uh, brought pancreatic surgery into the contemporary era. He brought in some young guys, <coughs> some young guys too. Uh, Diana mentioned uh, uh, my former boss at, at uh, Johns Hopkins, Dr. Cameron, and the guy I still sort of consider my boss, uh, Andy Warshaw at, at the MGH. And you can see them in a little bit of a, a younger uh, uh, phase. But uh, they, again, picked up that ball from Charlie and, and Bill's leadership. And then eventually, uh, I think they passed it on to the new generation of leaders, uh, which uh, has, again, it took three to replace two. <clears throat> one of which we're very honored, I think, to have here, Bill Nelon. And, and truthfully, uh, Bill is one of those guys who's tackled the, the tough disease of, of chronic pancreatitis throughout his career. Uh, Mike Barnell from the Mayo Clinic, Doug Evans, who's now at Milwaukee. So that is the leadership of the club. But there's never a meeting that goes on that, that we don't recognize the contributions that, that Charlie made in starting this organization and maintaining it for so many years. And, and for that, I think we all are appreciative. Again, it's an invigorating meeting, uh, lots of discussion, it's, it's very informal, and, and people really have a lot of fun, and that's just at the meeting. You should see us at the banquet. <laughs> and if, if, uh, since we're in California, if any of you have never been to the Pancreas Club, it will be held uh, in May at, at DDW in San Diego, and I certainly urge anyone who's not been there uh, to attend, and, and Charlie, I, I would love to hope to see you there uh, just for a day. So now I'm going to switch. As I said, I'm not an expert. Uh, I'm not going to bring Coles to uh, Newcastle and, and talk about chronic pancreatitis. I'm going to talk about the area that probably does affect most of us. And, and like Charlie, I will make a plea to, to recognize that it probably doesn't receive the degree of funding that it should <clears throat> from either uh, the NIH or other organizations. But it is a disease that, that really impacts many people. And it's a disease which, unfortunately, although We've made great progress uh, in the surgical side of things. We still have a long, long ways to go to impact the disease as a malignancy, as, an, as a cancer. <coughs> it is a, a disease that, that uh, uh, I think uh, uh, we are starting to see a little bit of progress, uh, and they're catching up in, in some of the areas of medical and radiation oncology, and, and perhaps maybe the future is getting brighter, and I will share that with you a little bit later. The demographics of pancreatic cancer <coughs> is the fourth leading uh, cancer, GI cancer, uh, in the, uh, or excuse me, the fourth leading cause of cancer death in the United States and the second most common uh, GI cancer. There's 44,000 new cases diagnosed every year, unfortunately with almost an equal number of deaths. The five-year survivor for, survival for all comers is 4%. Uh, the one-year survival is 18%. Uh, and, and truthfully, uh, uh, with a uh, uh, five-year survival after resection, isn't much better than that 18% uh, even now. Unfortunately, the, the numbers are going up. Uh, it peaked as, as we got better with diagnosis, and, and we thought it had plateaued, but the numbers do seem to be going up. So it is a problem that is not going away. Unfortunately, for many, it's, it's a problem with the stage of diagnosis. Uh, many patients present with metastatic or locally advanced unresectable disease uh, with only a small minority that are actually localized and resectable. And unfortunately, it is a disease in which there's a nihilistic attitude and, and that people uh, oftentimes don't get offered uh, therapy because uh, of the, the bad reputation it has. And, and 
you're diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and, and you're not referred to the proper institutions to get the proper uh, uh, referrals to see the oncologist and the surgeons who may be able to offer, uh, offer uh, uh, you some potential for, for benefit. And, and unfortunately, like so many things in our world, uh, there are social and economic and racial disparities in how these uh, uh, treatments are, are provided. So I'd like to focus on what's new, if there's anything bright that we can talk about in pancreatic uh, cancer surgery, and, and specifically better imaging and staging that's now available, the recognition of the importance of regionalization to high volume centers. So as I mentioned, some improved neoadjuvant and adjuvant therapy that, that are having some, some impressive results. I'll touch briefly, although I'm a maximally invasive, large port, single incision uh, uh, surgeon, <laughs> uh, I will talk a little bit about minimally invasive pancreatic surgery, and then I'll touch a little bit about our understanding of a precursor of, of pancreatic cancer known as IPMNs. Uh, the diagnosis of pancreatic cancer starts with clinical suspicion. Unfortunately, the early symptoms are rather vague, but not very well defined, and can be confused for gallstones, which are far more common, or other things. And, and thus, really, unfortunately, in many cases, until somebody gets jaundice, the diagnosis may not be obvious. Uh, with all due respect to all the tests that are down there below, uh, I think most of us think a, a good pancreatic protocol CT scan can give you about all the information you need <clears throat> to decide who needs an operation, who doesn't. Unfortunately, that doesn't stop us from, from doing a lot of other things, uh, but uh, really the CT is key. The quality of, of the imaging to be able to detect the small hypodense lesion to look for metastatic disease in the liver and the peritoneal cavity, as well as the relationship to the major visceral vessels can, can really all be accomplished uh, uh, with a good, well-performed uh, CT scan. Uh, again, many cases there's not only a mass, but uh, the dilatation from the obstruction of, of the pancreatic duct that, that can lead to the diagnosis. Uh, here we see a, a perfect example of, of what people like Bill and I and, and Charlie always looked for, what, was this tumor invading the, uh, the major visceral vessels, and, and uh, uh, again, this is an area where we've made some progress, as opposed to this case, where again, a larger tumor is invading the supramesoteric uh, and, and uh, portal venous system, who would be considered locally advanced, uh, or at least borderline resected. Uh, the other tests uh, that we can add, the, the role of ERCP has pretty much been eliminated as a diagnostic procedure. It still has an important role in stenting of patients uh, to prepare them for surgery. But we've recognized uh, that not everything we do comes without a cost. And the introduction of a stent in a patient who doesn't need it probably increases the surgical complications by introducing bacteria. So uh, again, if we need it for, for long-term uh, preoperative neoadjuvant therapy, it's a, it's a good procedure to have. But I, I don't think it should be a knee-jerk response that everybody with uh, obstructive jaundice should have, have a stent placed before they see a surgeon. Endoscopic ultrasound has replaced the percutaneous biopsies to, to get a tissue diagnosis. This is great from a lot of reasons. It's a lot easier to stick a small tumor from, from a centimeter or two away uh, through an endoscopic uh, localization as opposed to percutaneously. But the other important factor is, is there's no longer the concern about tracking of the, of the cancer along the, the path of the needle uh, that enters percutaneously uh, as you go through the duodenum and, and can get a tissue diagnosis. The value of tissue diagnosis is really, for most of us uh, who are, are experienced pancreatic surgeons, is not to tell us to operate, but it's in those cases where we do want to do neoadjuvant therapy, because I think in the clinical setting, uh, most people will feel comfortable with proceeding without a, without a tissue diagnosis. Whereas, uh, again, if you're going to use neoadjuvant therapy, it, it is very important. I mentioned uh, the Whipple operation. Uh, it was uh, reported in 1935 by, by Dr. You weren't there, were you, for that one, Charlie? <laughs> 1935, uh, at the, again, at the American Surgical Treatment of the Carcinoma of the Ampulla of the Pancreas by, by Whipple. Uh, and again, this was uh, uh, about 35 cases. Uh, uh, and, and Whipple uh, really made a lot of contributions uh, in bringing this operation forward. But it wasn't a very safe operation. And in fact, uh, uh, in the 60s and 70s, it was associated with a perioperative uh, morbidity that was extraordinarily high, 80 to 90 percent, a hospital mortality of, of 25 percent. It was associated with a long-term survival for pancreatic cancer of, of only about 5 percent. So to look at it, I mean, you were killing four patients, one out of every four patients, and only one out of 20 was surviving. There was actually legitimate calls to abandon pancreatic duodenectomy, at least for, for pancreatic cancer. Again, that's where John Howard stepped in. He, he reported a series from, <coughs> from uh, Toledo, where he was the chair of about 35 or 40 patients 
consecutive without any deaths, and, and that made people like John Cameron, and Andy Warshaw, and Murray Brennan, and uh, that next generation of surgical oncologists to realize, hey, we can do this operation safe. And then that's led to the, the flourish now of, of uh, uh, pancreatic cancer surgery and pancreatic surgery for other pancreatic diseases that, that probably wouldn't have started without their leadership. I'd like to uh, share a little bit of contemporary information. <clears throat> and I, I guess anytime I quote data from Hopkins, it's really not contemporary because <clears throat> I've been <clears throat> gone for so long, but uh, this uh, is indeed, uh, uh, that institution has the, has the largest experience and they haven't uh, 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 tightened up now. The funny thing about that number, 2,943 pancreatic adenectomies in our institutional database, Charlie, I want you to know John is starting to approach that number himself, and if you call him right now, he can give you that number to the day, I think, uh, uh, of how many he's done, but uh, uh, again, uh, it's a high volume center. Uh, 1,400 done for pancreatic cancer. Uh, again, this is a little bit about some of the, the demographics of the operation. First of all, it's, a, it's an operation that, that has been expanded to the, the criteria. We were talking earlier in M&M &M about the doing a, a living-related transplant in, in somebody who's in over 65 or in their 70s. So when I was a resident, uh, I guess I would say in the 80s, John had a rule that you couldn't do a Whipple on a patient who was over 70 years of age. I think that's pretty unique now that he's 78 and doing, maybe 79, yesterday was his birthday, I think. Uh, uh, he's 79 and doing, uh, you know, 100 whipples a year. But uh, again, it's been expanded to an older age group. Uh, there's still, uh, it, even at, at Hopkins, uh, there is some uh, racial disparities in the population that we see. The mortality has gone down dramatically from 25% to an overall from that series of, of 2%. And really, it's continued to go down uh, at most of uh, the big institutions, the high volume institutions, promote to, or, or report uh, mortality rates, perioperative mortality rates of, of less than 2%. Uh, it is still an operation with a high number of complications. Uh, uh, 35, 40% is, is pretty consistent. And actually, uh, the, the number of complications has actually gone up as, as we've expanded the indications and, and uh, uh, the age and the patients with comorbidities. Uh, the reoperation rate is low, and, and really the, the management of complications is what this operation is all about. The use of a multidisciplinary team, interventional radiology to drain abscesses and to stop bleeding, I, I think has been very important. Uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the length of stay has, has continued to be shortened, uh, and uh, of course, uh, even now, uh, though I think length of stay is almost directly proportional to the rate of, of complications that you have. If you can avoid complications, patients are now going home in, in five or six days. And in fact, uh, I, I had to restrain my house staff from sending an 83-year-old home on post-operative day five today. I said, can't we just hold on to her for one more day until I get back tomorrow to at least see her? Most of the complications are, are, are fortunately, they're, they're, they're more than nuisances, but they're not life-threatening. Delayed gastric emptying, uh, a pancreatic fish wound infection, uh, uh, and then some of the other things like cholangitis, sepsis, and other leaks could be problematic. But again, through the knowledge that we've gained through the managing these complications, most of these are no longer considered life-threatening. A little bit about our experience at, at, at the MGH, uh, again, a little bit more contemporary going to, to 2013. Uh, in uh, uh, 2013, we did almost 200 procedures. Uh, pancreatic adenectomies are still the most common, uh, uh, about two-thirds of these. Distal pancreatectomies, we've converted to laparoscopic like most places. Then sort of the odd other combinations of mid-segment pancreatectomies, total pancreatectomies, and nucleation. Our length of stay is down to seven days. The key number that we all talk about now is 15% is, uh, uh, reoperation. Again, very, very low, one case. And we had a little blip in mortality in 2013. I'm happy to report in 2000. It wasn't just me coming to the MJH. Uh, it, it was uh, a little blip. Uh, the year before, in 2012, it was 0%. I'm happy to say back uh, in, in 2014, and knock on wood, in 2015, we're back below 2%. Um, again, the, uh, the complications, uh, uh, no complications is, is pretty uncommon. Pancreatic fistula, about 10%. The other uh, leaks, uh, uh, a little less frequently. Uh, other complications, uh, including intra-abdominal abscesses, uh, uh, remain relatively frequent. Uh, distal pancreatectomy, again, as you see, uh, I have the uh, laparoscopic experience in, in uh, a red. 
Uh, it is uh, increasing the number of patients who are able to o offer laparoscopic. I'll talk about laparoscopic uh, Whipples a little bit later. Uh, distal pancreatectomies, uh, the fistula rate remains high, if not higher. <clears throat> we do a little bit better job of managing those patients with respect to uh, length of stay and readmissions. And, and laparoscopically does, uh, does help in this case, I, I think, in, in sh shortening the length of stay and, and eliminating the bigger incisions. And, and certainly would seem, in my mind, to be indicated <clears throat> for many lesions, maybe not all the cancers, but many lesions of the body and tail of the gland. So why did these results improve? Well, I think in one reason it improved was the recognition that this isn't an operation that should be done by the casual uh, or, or, or uh, somebody who, who considers pancreatic surgery sort of their part-time job. I, I think the focus of this operation uh, in centers of excellence, high volume centers, is, has made a big difference. <coughs> this is a paper, again, that was <coughs> from the Hopkins group. But, and this has become, it's been kind of, for those of you who, who follow uh, uh, the American College of Surgeons blog, so this is a pretty hot topic, and I'd love to talk to Julie about it, is there is now some pressure, again, being asserted on whether or not operations should be formally restricted to high volume centers, and the minimum should be applied to the number of, of uh, uh, operations you do at your hospital, uh, or operations that you do as a surgeon, for some of these complex operations, like Whipple procedure, like aortic uh, repair, like esophagectomy uh, uh, and those. But uh, again, the data supporting it is pretty good, that if you look at the low volume institutions, uh, you know, the mortality can get fairly high, and you move out here to those institutions. Of, of course, here's Hopkins at 250 uh, Whipples a year. Uh, you can see the mortality is very low with a, a pretty strong correlation. Uh, but, but again, it's, it's more complicated than just the numbers, and that's a topic for a debate to, to have uh, in many different settings. And much of this information uh, uh, came out of Hopkins, but it also came out of uh, John Berkmeyer when he was at Dartmouth and has continued on at Michigan looking, again, at the direct effect of, of hospital mortality related to the volume associated with the institution <clears throat> going from 16%. Not much different than it was in the, you know, in the 60s and 70s, uh, you know, down to 2% uh, uh, in, the, in the very high volume institutions. It, and again, this, this was almost 20 years ago, so this isn't a new phenomenon. Um, so again, I think we've come a long ways in how we do this operation. I think we've trained generations of surgeons through whether it be surgical oncology fellowships, good residency training, uh, HPB fellowships, or even transplant fellowships to do this operation safe. But it, as I will now start switching, we've still got a long ways to go uh, in our survival. Now, when you look at, at a tumor of the pancreas, uh, again, I think the first thing to realize is not every tumor in that area is uh, uh, considered to be equal. Uh, certainly, you can have very big neuroendocrine tumors with great survival. Uh, I'll speak later about IPMNs, which are interductal papillary mucinous neoplasms that can have invasive cancer with, with pretty good survival. But unfortunately, the, the drop-off, and again, this is now a 10-year drop-off, but, but even in five years, uh, we still have a long ways to go in, in terms of uh, uh, improving our, our long-term survival. Uh, the usual factors uh, uh, affect survival, tumor diameter, lymph node status, margin status, histologic grade. Uh, again, using a, a multivariate analysis, uh, what will show up uh, is, is, again, as one would expect. Uh, I will talk a bit later about the role of adjuvant therapy, uh, but, but clearly uh, uh, the patient factors make, make a huge difference. Uh, have we gotten better with this uh, survival over the decades? There was some suggestion that there was some initial improvement from the 70s and 80s, but, but frankly, it's sort of flattened out in, in, in the 90s and 2000s that, that we still have got a long ways to go in terms of improving survival. Does it make any difference where you have your Whipple operation? I mean, clearly I showed you that it makes a difference that you have at a high volume center in terms of surviving the surgery. But how about being cured of your cancer? And this was some work that was done by Human Fong, where, where they looked at, at survival now, and this is days, not years, but days. And, and as you can see, if you had your operation in a high volume hospital versus a low volume hospital, you had a, a very significant improvement in survival. That means you probably had a better operation. But there are other factors uh, that, that might affect it. You may have a better chemotherapy, you may have better radiation, may be a lot of factors that contribute to it. But obviously, you'd say, well, that's because more people survive the surgery. But if, if you look at those patients who actually 
survived the operation, i.e. lived over 30 days in the perioperative period, it still makes a difference. And I think that attributes to being able to have a higher chance of a negative margin, a broader and better lymph node uh, resection, and, and then some of the other factors that go into the treatment. So again, I do honestly believe volume makes a difference in, in this disease. Uh, again, I, I talked earlier that not everything that looks like a pancreatic cancer behaves like a pancreatic cancer. There are four cancers in this area, duodenal, ampullary, bile duct, and, and pancreas, and, and their survivals are clearly different. So again, if you see a 75, 80 year old person with obstructive jaundice, uh, you, you shouldn't be nihilistic and say, well, it's pancreatic cancer, their chances of surviving, uh, it, it, even if it's resectable, it, is only 10 or 15%, because uh, again, uh, uh, an 87 year old I did last week had an ampullary cancer, and she probably has got a better chance of, of uh, uh, you know, living to be 92, 93 than, than uh, uh, somebody who had had a pancreatic cancer, and I think they need to be offered this opportunity. IPMNs, a, a relatively new diagnosis, first brought it to our attention in the mid-1990s as small cystic lesions found throughout the pancreas, many of them as incidental findings. Some of them can be of substantial size uh, and actually can cause symptoms as, such as jaundice or, or pancreatitis. Uh, they, uh, this doesn't project too well, but uh, again, they are papillary. Uh, uh, they are oftentimes combined uh, both cystic and, and solid nature to them. Uh, the cancers obviously rest in the solid component. Uh, and the complexities of management uh, are, are tremendous and are still debated. Uh, there's been a group that's worked together twice. They've gotten together a consensus uh, conference in Japan with leaders from this country, leaders from Europe, leaders certainly from Japan, where, where this was first brought to our attention going through the whole algorithm of how these patients are, are, are managed, and but yet our colleagues in, in gastroenterology a, a few months ago wrote a, a sort of a scathing review that it's all overrated and we're probably doing far too many procedures. So there's still a lot to learn about these, but, but we do recognize that they are pre-malignant and there's certainly indications, clear indications, such as the main duct type versus the side branch type uh, uh, that, that you uh, uh, clearly have to operate. How you follow and, and uh, look after these patients with the small incidental findings is still being evolved. But what we do know is, is that if you can identify the lesions, that they, as either pre-malignant certainly, but, but even in malign earlier stages of malignancy, uh, they do have a definite uh, better chance of being cured than pancreatic ductal carcinoma. And it has clearly affected our, our volume at our institution. Uh, again, these hardly were seen in the early 1990s. And now uh, uh, they constitute about 17% of, of the uh, pancreatic resections that, that we do at the Mass General Hospital. And I think that'd be pretty safe at, at most of the major centers. So let's, uh, let's leave the surgical side of things for a minute and focus where I honestly think most of the advances need to take place to uh, change this disease. And, and that's in the role of adjuvant therapy. Now, again, I say current standard of care. This is now evolving, but uh, at least a couple years ago, I think they considered the current standard of care to be uh, gemcitabine for resected ductal carcinoma. And at least in this country, uh, it was oftentimes uh, <clears throat> followed with, with radiation therapy. Our, our friends in Europe don't believe in radiation as much as we do in the United States, but they don't make as much money as our radiation therapists do giving the therapy, so maybe that, that's the a factor, but uh, the, uh, um, <clears throat> clearly there's been demonstrated in a number of settings that, that uh, um, chemo radiation after surgery offers some advantage. Uh, this trial did come from Europe, uh, a bit controversial. It was sort of a four by four study with observation versus chemotherapy, and again, most would say 5-FU is, is no longer the standard of care, plus, plus chemo radiation, and, and there was benefit for chemotherapy but no benefit for chemoradiation, but uh, people were pretty critical of, of those results. The role of immunotherapy has, has been touted, and, and this is a, a, a program that Hopkins has taken the lead on through the years, uh, in which uh, a, a genetically modified tumor vaccine is prepared, actually from the patient's own tumors and, and given back to the patients, and hoping to, to sort of fire up their immune system to help, help fight the tumors. Uh, these are <clears throat> the results of a number of series. This was the classic series that made people start thinking about the role of, of, uh, of uh, uh, chemotherapy. Amazing, 21 patients uh, uh, in 1985 really led to this the whole parade towards uh, uh, chemoradiation. Uh, 
And it, it has continued on. The SPAC trials supported it. This is a, a trial that came out of Virginia Mason uh, with, uh, again, a good friend of, of uh, Charlie's, Bill Traverso, taking the lead on this. And then, and then the Hopkins vaccine trial. And, and again, people are excited about all these opportunities that are out there. But sort of the new kid on the block is the role of neoadjuvant therapy. <clears throat> now, there, there are really three reasons uh, to consider neoadjuvant therapy. Number one, there's nothing more disappointing than to do a Whipple procedure and have the patients come back for their first oncology consult and get a CT scan despite the fact that I was in the abdomen two months ago, that he had or she had had imaging, you know, two and a half months ago, and have that first CT scan show up with liver metastasis. So there are certainly a subgroup of patients who are going to recur early that, that perhaps we can select out. <clears throat> Number two, and I wish Doug Evans would have been here because he used to debate us about the role of neoadjuvant therapy, which he was a big proponent of when he was at, at MD Anderson versus sort of the Hopkins put everything into the basket afterwards with adjuvant therapy. And, and he always gave one slide that even in the, you know, the mecca of pancreatic surgery with the best results, one out of every three patients who got a Whipple for pancreatic cancer never recovered to the point where they could get their adjuvant therapy. They were too debilitated, their functional status never got to the point where, where they could tolerate it. And so by giving your therapy up front, you can guarantee that the patients will get treated. And, and as I'll talk further, they can get treated in a very now new and aggressive fashion that many people will not offer for the post-operative state. And then finally, uh, again, one of that early pie chart, there are a lot of patients who present with tumors encroaching upon, invading, occluding, involving the major visceral vessels that up until a, a while ago were considered non-operatives just because of, of the fact that uh, morbidity, mortality, the positive margins, the overall survival, once you started doing multivisceral vessel re resections, were pretty high. So these make pretty solid arguments. On the other hand, uh, there is no certainly high level proof of any kind that it does improve survival. And some, such as John Cameron, would say you'll miss the window of opportunity in, in some patients. I'm not sure that, that truthfully, uh, a few months makes a difference. But this pendulum has now swung from, from very short courses up to people getting maybe up to a year of chemo rads be, before they ever come to surgery. And obviously that, uh, that will affect the, the window to some extent. The problem is, uh, and it's shame on us, is we've never been able to get the powers to be to, to really do the proper multi-center trial involving those institutions uh, uh, that, that, that really have the good results. Uh, uh, as I said, Doug at MD Anderson, Doug Evans has, has done his own phase two trials uh, and had great results. We have a number of trials going on, but I think you're never going to answer this question unless we can get, get people really to put aside their personal agendas and, and come up with, with the, the proper trial. Uh, again, there's been multiple phase two trials. Uh, we do know you can do it safely. There's, there's no increase in perioperative morbidity mortality. You do decrease the incidence of positive margins. Uh, and, and again, uh, as mentioned, more patients can get their full therapy in the uh, preoperative state than they can postoperative. I mentioned Doug, uh, Doug Evans and MD Anderson. Uh, again, the most recent trial that they reported, 64 patients uh, using uh, gemcitabine and x-ray therapy. 38% uh, were node positive, 26% had an R1 resection, which is pretty low. Median survival, 34 months. Five-year survival, 36%. Again, uh, not great, but, but some improvement over the 20% that we see in a lot of other areas. There's been a meta-analysis of, of these phase two trials, 536 patients. 25% were considered borderline resectable or even unresectable. A good response in a third of the patients. Again, most of these were your standard gemcitabine and, and radiation therapy. 32% uh, of these borderline cases were resected. Survival for patients who might have otherwise been considered unresectable was, was 22, 22 months. So what is, uh, there's, we're looking at newer ways to do this uh, at our institution. We ha you have a proton beam here? So proton beam, uh, again, is a new form of radiation therapy that's ideal really for brain tumors in kids. 
if you're going to build a multi-million dollar machine, you're looking for every possible indication to use it. Uh, uh, and uh, so we, we've done some trials with pancreatic cancer. Uh, I, I can't say that it's convincing, but at least it, it probably offers an opportunity to provide in five days the, the radiation that you might be able to provide in, in five weeks. But what really has perhaps changed the, the landscape with respect to pancreatic cancer, both post-op in metastatic disease, but now more than ever, I think, in the neoadjuvant setting, it is, again, combination of, of drugs such as Fulferinox. And perhaps maybe we'll get to better drugs because these are really a bunch of old drugs sort of thrown together. But it started with, with the, uh, the, with this trial, which uh, compared standard uh, gemcitabine versus Fulferinox, and, and these were all stage four metastatic cancer. Uh, and, and basically what they, they, they showed was uh, a significant improval in, in median survival, almost a doubling, uh, one year survival, more than a doubling, and 18 month survival, a, a tripling in, in the, in the uh, uh, benefits in terms of survival. Uh, uh, here we see the, uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, Kaplan-Meier curve, again, showing the survival, of a highly significant uh, uh, benefit for these patients, again, with stage four uh, unresectable disease. Now, the problem with this is it's a pretty toxic therapy. It's so toxic that even in, in young, healthy people uh, who've had a Whipple procedure, many oncologists are he hesitant to give it in the post-operative situation. But they can generally get the patients through it, as, as you'll see in a few minutes, uh, in a neoadjuvant setting and, and have some pretty good results. So I, I won't say that, that you know, we're the only people in the world to figure this out because it's, it's I think, being done at all the, all the major institutions now in a neoadjuvant protocol. But uh, we were one of the first to uh, report it. Uh, uh, my colleague, uh, Christina Ferroni, took the lead on this paper, and I clearly give credit to uh, uh, David Ryan and, and uh, Ted Hong and, and many of our, our colleagues in the other specialties uh, to look at Fulfirinox in the locally advanced borderline resectable pancreatic cancer, presented at the SSO in 2014 and published in Annals in 2015. And the impetus to this was, was going back uh, to 2010. Uh, this was a 63-year-old pretty healthy male with a 3.5 centimeter pancreatic ductal carcinoma. And, and again, I, I know somebody like Bill Nealon will look at this and say, here's your celiac axis and it's, it's uh, you know, totally invaded and, and uh, splenic arteries taken out and, and the like. So this patient, although the CA199 wasn't too high, the patient uh, got eight cycles of Fulfirinox, which eight cycles is about six months, and, and, and got standard uh, uh, chemo radiation with uh, 5-FU, CA199 fell to 18, and, and things looked a bit better, although not great. But we ended up uh, uh, being aggressive with this, this guy, and, and we found that even though the CT scan didn't really tell the whole story, that we were able to complete a distal pancreatectomy with splenectomy with a retroperitoneal lymph node dissection and found only two microscopic foci of residual invasive cancer uh, and that uh, there was 90% tumor regression and, and all the lymph nodes were negative and the, the patient still, you now five years later, is still alive with no evidence of recurrence by any of the, the imaging techniques. Now I know there are people who here do rectal cancer, I know there are people who do esophageal cancer, and you've seen that in both of those diseases, but this is really the first time we have seen it uh, in, in pancreatic cancer. So uh, we, we started a, a sort of, it's, it's not, again, it's a, a phase two trial, it, it, it's not randomized, but we started to look at the evaluation of, of, of this, this therapy. Uh, a total of uh, 207 resections. Uh, again, 87 patients were, were considered to be resectable. So we only chose those patients who had advanced disease uh, or borderline resectable to, to offer Fulfirinox in close to 60. And, and uh, again, here you see how it's a combination, it's mixed, uh, you know, there's some with standard radiation, there's standard radiation plus intraoperative radiation, here's the proton beam and some other combination. So again, it, 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 to say that it was a well-defined protocol, it would be overstating it, but it was prospective analysis of, of this series. And uh, uh, again, if you look at the, the 59 patients, here's a little bit about what, the, what they look like. Uh, uh, their uh, uh, CA199 was, uh, was elevated, uh, uh, or was normal in only 19%. Uh, 
uh, fell from 169 as a, a median or 646 as a mean, uh, uh, 19% normal. This was the tumor size. This was, uh, this was very interesting. What we did is we dusted off Andy Warshaw. I had him go and look at all these uh, uh, CT scans in a blinded fashion and, and grade them to whether or not they were, were uh, uh, considered locally advanced or borderline. It's not too much different than, than what we look at. So this was the pre-treatment and this was the post-treatment. And again, tumor diameters got smaller, CA199 went down, but still there was a lot of lag in, in terms of, of the response. These tumors don't go away. Uh, and uh, again, I'll show you a few examples. This is, again is a young woman presenting with uh, 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 approximately three and a half centimeter pancreatic ductal cancer. Here it is in the unsnate, wrapped around the SMA, got four months of fulfirinox and radiation therapy, and didn't look a lot better, maybe a little suggestion of a, a, a fat plane there. Here's a 69 year old, again had a four centimeter mass, uh, again with involvement here of, of the celiac trunk. CA199 uh, 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 was over 13,000. Uh, again, after four months of, of uh, Fulfirinox, her CA199 was 25. The CT scan had, had showed some regression. She was taken to the opera room again with nearly a complete response with rare tumor glands uh, spanning approximately two centimeters with some canceration, but all ducts negative with no vascular resection and, and all lymph nodes negative. Uh, older, so again, pushing the limit a little bit, 79-year-old woman with back pain, CT scan showed surrounding a tumor, five centimeter tumor surrounding the, the portal vein and, and SMA, pretty impressive, CA199 wasn't that elevated, four months of Fulfirinox, uh, response uh, seemed good, uh, again, this paper, uh, this patient uh, again uh, had a, a dramatic response with a margin negative, no vascular resection and 30 negative lymph nodes. So this, uh, uh, again, compares our Fulfirinox patients with our patients who off the bat we consider to be resectable. So this is the preferred group. They had no visceral vessel involvement. Obviously none of them had metastatic disease. So let's look at, at, at the differences, uh, particularly in terms of the operation and, and some of the complications. So again, operative time, these are tough operations. Uh, six hour operations, uh, you know, so adds about an hour in terms of length of the procedure. We lose more blood. And, and, and frankly, I think a couple of mine are up on this 7,000 range. So they can be tough. But look at the, despite the longer operation, the more blood loss, the complication rates go down by almost 50%. Uh, pancreatic fistula is non-existent. Now, Bill knows that these are like chronic pancreatitis patients. They have rock hard glands and big dilated ducts. And after radiation, they're not gonna leak. But, oops, excuse me, but still, uh, the fact that any series of has a 0% pancreatic fistula rate. The admissions were, were lower. Length of stay was actually lower. Again, longer operation, more blood loss. They're going home sooner and, and no deaths. So these patients, despite getting the therapy uh, uh, and, and having tough operations, do pretty well. The pathologic results, again, I remind you that, that these patients, when they presented and went right to the OR, were viewed to be favorable on their CT scan. These are the ones who got Fulfirinox. Node positive, only a third versus 80%. Again, favorable patients, unfavorable patients. <clears throat> Lymph node metastasis, uh, a highly significant difference. 93% uh, R0 a resection versus 86. Uh, that's good in either case. Uh, lymphatic invasion lower, perineural invasion uh, again lower. So, and tumor size lower. So, this is dramatically having a pathologic effect and, and and uh, allowing us to, to do operations that we probably wouldn't have done before. Uh, we have, again, near complete responses with uh, only a minuscule uh, residual tumor in at least five patients. So, so what about survival? Obviously, this is, this is what we, we have to care about. Uh, again, the follow-up, uh, uh, again, this is a median follow-up uh, uh, from the time of diagnosis. And, and uh, again, it, it's, it's not perfect, uh, but uh, there, there has been uh, a pretty good survival for uh, the patients who, who uh, uh, received the, receive the therapy. And if you look at them in a Kaplan-Meier presentation, we've at least shifted the curve. Uh, and, and this is significant at the at P less than 0 0.1 level. Now, this is where we drop off. And, and obviously, uh, uh, we're still at 36, uh, 48 months. Uh, uh, we've still got a long ways to go before uh, we can pat ourselves on the back and say we've cured the disease. But, but still, it's encouraging that, again, many of these patients wouldn't have been offered an operation. 
So it does seem to have a significant impact on locally advanced and borderline pancreatic cancer. The key is you can't believe the imaging anymore. Uh, you have to just take a risk and take them to the OR. Uh, and in general, you, you can get away with uh, and find that you can resect without visceral vessel invasion. Uh, there's been no increase in post-operative morbidity and mortality, and at least uh, pathologically there seems to be some advantages. Uh, and again, there is a trend towards uh, uh, perhaps some improvement in, in early survival. So I'm going to flip gears now because the cases I've just been talking about you wouldn't approach in a laparoscopic or minimally invasive fashion. And, and again, uh, as opposed to bringing Coles to Newcastle, I'm totally out of my league talking about this because they're really... Uh, only a limited number of institutions that have the kind of volumes, but I, I do want to give credit to the, the people who are taking the lead on this. Uh, uh, this is the experience from the Mayo Clinic uh, with laparoscopic uh, uh, pancreatic odudinectomy, or so-called straight stick resection. And this is all one guy. This is Mike Kendrick, who's a fantastic both laparoscopic pancreatic surgeon. Compared, uh, this was the way they compared it. it certainly was not a, a prospective trial. 108 laparoscopic versus uh, 214 uh, uh, open pancreatic odudinectomies. This was at the ASA in 2014. Got to update the slide. It was, was published last October. Uh, again, there was no differences in neoadjuvant therapy, tumor size, lymph node, or margin positivity. And the truth is, Mike can do just about anything. He can do vein resections. He can do anything. Uh, he does uh, show decreased blood loss, a decreased length of stay in the lap group, uh, six versus nine days, uh, and, and some oncologic benefit in that the patients who uh, uh, had an open procedure were less likely to be uh, um, available to start their post-operative therapy in the window of time when, when it would be used. Uh, there was no difference in overall survival, uh, and the progression-free survival was slightly increased, uh, although, uh, again, not, uh, I guess, what reads statistically significance, but I, I don't think that is really a, a factor that, that one can talk about. The technique, there's not many Mike Kendricks walking around, and, and with all due respect, if there's somebody here that's, that's doing them laparoscopically, you're, you're something better than I am. Uh, the, uh, the Da Vinci robot has become the tool that a lot of people ha have used because of the, uh, the ability to suture, which uh, is, is uh, uh, really a challenge for, for many of these patients. Uh, the experience here has, has come primarily from the, the um, uh, PMC group headed by Herb Zay. Uh, uh, although he's not the first author on that, he was kind of the leader. They reported, again, the, the American Surgical Association meeting a year before that. Uh, again, 250 cases with 132 uh, robotic pancreatic odontectomies. Uh, again, the time, if you look at where they started, it was about 10 hours. Now they were down to 527 minutes. Uh, the uh, um, uh, transfusion level was very low. Complications were low. These numbers in parentheses represent the complications for, for Whipples as opposed to the overall complications. Uh, Reoperation, very low. Mortality, uh, again, no different than what most good series show for uh, uh, pancreatic odontectomy and open. Not a great uh, uh, improvement in length of stay, still 10 days, and readmission still at 28%. So I, I don't think you can really say, oh, this is, is a game changer in terms of, of doing the operation safer. Uh, but uh, again, they had R0 resections in 88% of the patients. and an adequate uh, lymph node harvest. Uh, so it, it kind of falls into the every other operation that's been done robotically. Uh, it can be done. It, it, it's a challenge to learn the technique, but uh, it, is, uh, it, it is out there and, and uh, I encourage people if, if, uh, if you want to uh, build your career and, and uh, uh, to make this better, it, it might work, but the cost uh, benefit of this is, is really where the challenge is. As I come to a close, uh, again, as I try to update pancreatic cancers, we come to the end of 2015. I think the perioperative outcomes continue to improve in great part due to the regionalization of care. I think we've seen that neoadjuvant therapy may increase our resectability for locally advanced cancers, offering opportunity to help more patients. Uh, uh, the role of minimally invasive pancreatic resection will, will certainly increase in the future. Uh, what can we do to make things better? I, I think these patients do need to be done in hospitals that are, are high volume with more experienced surgical teams, not just the surgeons, but the anesthesiologists, the intensivists, the interventional radiologists. We obviously need to do how to do the operation right to obtain negative margins, uh, using neoadjuvant chemo radiation if there's any, uh, anything close. We've got to get better. We've got to do clinical trials and, and enrolling the patients in clinical trials is important. Uh, how to better identify uh, those patients uh, who we really have nothing to offer, really won't benefit, 
and learn how to understand and, and more aggressively manage uh, precursors lesions without operating on everybody with a, a uh, uh, an IPMN. Doesn't seem to want to go. Maybe his last slide didn't get at it. Oh, there it is. So here we are in beautiful uh, Central California. I had to just share with you this this great picture of the 200-year-old bullfinch building uh, uh, where we still meet every Wednesday morning and a little snow on the ground. And I think back to what it was like in, in <laughs> February. Uh, this was one of the main thoroughfares. Anybody who's a Patriots fan, this is what ben, or what uh, Foxborough looked like. This is, this is Fenway. Fortunately, I live in a condo. I didn't have to deal with the ice uh, 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 dams that were built up. But this is the most impressive slide that I'm showing the whole day. So Boston doesn't have a lot of space, and they won't let you throw the snow into the river or into the ocean. So they have snow farms. So these are this isn't your kid's sandbox with the little Tonka toys here. I mean, this is a full caterpillar and, and uh, uh, you know whatever these things are. You can see them pushing. This is snow all moved out of Boston uh, out to these snow farms. <clears throat> and there was a big sort of a over under when the bet with this would finally melt. And I, and I think it was uh, uh, almost the first of August when the snow farms finally went away. So, so uh, again, it's a great honor and a pleasure to be here. Uh, and again, Charlie, congratulations on a great career. Congratulations to your institution for recognizing the many contributions you've made. And thank you for letting me be a small part of this great honor. snow to melt here yes. in California and we can kind of work out a deal and I think there's a business opportunity somehow there. Yeah, that's probably true. <laughs> Thank you again so much. It's really been a pleasure. So I want to invite everyone. We're going to have a, a little reception out on the uh, breezeway here. We're going to just if the family and friends and the chief residents would just take a minute to uh, come down. We're going to take a few pictures here and then we will meet you out on the breezeway and uh, opportunity to have particularly our residents and students uh, spend a little time with Dr. Fry and Dr. Lululemon. Thank you all again for being here.